Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar on protecting your family's future, inheritance tax and wills. The presenters today are myself, Eddie Harrington. I'm a director at Seymour Taylor. I also have my colleague, Louise Marshall, who is also a director. And between us, we'll be focusing on some of the areas that crop up in regular conversations with our clients. Also joining us is Jennifer Beaujou from BWK Solicitors, who will be covering various aspects of inheritance tax, and in particular, looking at wills, trusts, and a very important area of powers of attorney. attorney, um, attorney. We expect the presentations to last 40 to 45 minutes, and we've left some time at the end for any questions. We've actually already received a few, and so we'll cover those at, at that point in time. If you have any questions, please feel free to communicate them through the Q&A box or chat function, and we'll also pick those up later. We are recording this webinar, and we'll be making a copy of that recording available within the next few days. Just before we get into the presentation itself, I would like to mention that we did give some consideration to postponing this in light of the sad news and the passing of Queen Elizabeth. And certainly had it been scheduled before today, we would have done just that. Now that we've had our opportunity to pay our respects and thanks, we felt that had, had this uh, been pre-planned for quite some months now that we thought it was appropriate to go ahead. Actually, the subject of monarchy and taxes is, is a very interesting one. The Queen was granted exemption from inheritance tax following an agreement that was reached in 1993 with the government. At the same time, uh, the Queen also volunteered to pay income tax and capital gains tax, although she was not legally obliged to do so. So an interesting aside there. I always like to start with one of my favorite sayings uh, from Benjamin Franklin. In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. This is a quote going back to November 1789. And in my preparation for this particular webinar, I discovered that there were similar quotes going back as far as 1716. I, I found a comedy play called The Cobbler of Preston by Christopher Bullock, when it was said it was impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. So um, unlike inheritance tax itself, those old sayings obviously have been around quite a while. Inheritance tax was only introduced in 1986. So it's a relatively modern tax. It was introduced by the then chancellor, Nigel Lawson. There have been several inheritance tax uh, type taxes over the years, dating back to 1694. The one that existed previous to the current inheritance tax was called capital transfer tax, but that had only lasted 12 years. That came in uh, in 1974 to replace uh, estate duty. So moving on with some basic information, the total value of estates comes in at around 100 billion per year. There have been large increases over the past decade, unsurprisingly due to the a residential property situation. Obviously, values have gone up a lot with uh, property, and, and that's reflected in the estates. So, as I say, no great surprises there. However, only around 23,000 estates are liable to inheritance tax. That is less than 4% of the total. So, it is a relatively small number. And it always makes me feel that maybe there's some scope there to. Uh, for the exchequer to raise a little bit more money out of inheritance tax. To put this in some sort of context, though, 
the tax receipts from inheritance tax last year came to 6.1 billion. It was a 14% increase on the previous year, but bearing in mind what I said about the total value of estates being around 100 billion or, or maybe more, this is a relatively low tax take. And again, I do wonder if there is some more scope there. Uh, and to put this into a much wider tax take context, Last year, the government oversaw the collection of around £716 billion worth of tax. So the inheritance tax slice is a very small slice. It won't surprise you to learn that the biggest contributors to this are income tax, national insurance and capital gains tax, which account for around 55% of, of the total figure. VAT comes in at 21%, corporation tax at 9%. So as you can see, inheritance tax at something less than 1% is rather insignificant in the overall scheme of things. We did actually have a dip in receipts from inheritance tax uh, for the 1920 tax year. This is largely thought to be as a consequence of the introduction of the residence nil rate band, which potentially exempted a larger part of many estates. Louise will be covering this in a little bit more detail when I hand over to her shortly. But as I've mentioned just uh, a little bit earlier, the receipts have picked up again with that 14% increase between the previous two tax years. So I think at this point in time, it would be appropriate for me to hand over to Louise to cover some of the very specific inheritance tax issues and questions that are frequently raised by our clients. Over to you, Louise. Thank you, Eddie. So how much you can leave is um, often a regular question that crops up. Um, firstly, 325,000, which is the basic nil rate band, but this can actually be doubled up to 650,000. So as in answer B, for a surviving spouse, if on the first death, the allowance has not been used up. So if, for instance, on the first death, everything is left to the surviving spouse, that spouse will potentially have an exemption of 650,000 on their death. Similarly, the figures C and D also apply. Um, so 500,000 and a million work in the same way, but they apply when the resident's nil rate band can be claimed as well. This is a relatively new relief that applies to estates valued at £2 million or less where a residential property is passed down the family line. Interestingly, this doesn't actually have to still be owned upon death, as for example, it may have been necessary to sell this um, to facilitate residential care, for example. So as long as the proceeds are ring fenced and identifiable, then this relief can also be due. It's the value of the estate at death that is relevant. So deathbed planning is possible if actions can be taken to reduce one's estate at that point in time. There's also a form of tapering relief, which is available on estates with values between 2 million and 2.35 million. How much can you give away now? Well, technically C is the correct answer. There's no limit for what is called a potentially exempt transfer. And I'll cover this in a little bit more detail later. The other figures, A and B, 3,000 and 6,000, are the annual exemption or the annual exemption for two years if you haven't used up year one. It can be carried forward and used in year two. Beyond that, it will be lost. The consequence of the annual exemption is that when calculating an inheritance tax liability on death, it can be allocated against these potentially exempt transfers in the previous seven years, as one needs to survive a potentially exempt transfer by seven years so it doesn't get aggregated with the rest of the estate. So just as I mentioned, you need to survive a potentially exempt transfer, also known as a PET, commonly known as that, um, by seven years. So linked to this rule is a question in connection with tapering relief the real value of which is often misunderstood. Basically, after three years, a form of tapering relief can apply between three and seven years. However, it is the tax that gets tapered and not the value of the gift. By way of an example, if you made a gift of £100,000 but only survived it by five years, 
the full amount comes back into your estate for inheritance tax purposes. This is because the gift will be set against your nil rate band of the 325,000, which in turn produces a nil tax charge. So there is nothing to taper. Clearly gifts would need to be in excess of the nil rate band to qualify for any form of tapering relief. As I mentioned, this is a re relief that's not very well understood and um, people don't quite understand how it is applied. Another thing you might be considering is um, gifts out of surplus income. And um, this can be really valuable, but it's probably the most underused in terms of inheritance tax planning. So gifts out of surplus income um, is a good exemption and it avoids the gift being counted towards the seven year clock as um, I previously mentioned with the potentially exempt transfers. The gift has to be regular, so it needs to be at least twice. Twice is sufficient though. Um, it has to be paid out of your normal income, so without depleting your ability to meet usual living costs. So for an example of a gift out of surplus income could be making rental payments on behalf of the child who's left home, or perhaps maybe school fees for a grandchild, um, a regular annual family holiday that's paid for, regular sort of monetary Christmas and birthday gifts that you've got sort of evidence that you've been doing on a regular basis. There is a um, good form that HMRC have got, which is called IHT 403, um, which you can summarise these um, surplus of income gifts. Um, and it's a useful form to help you sort of calculate what is going to be um, relevant to your IHD estate. Uh, and um, which will also obviously help your executives in due course. So just to reiterate, as long as the donor, as long as the donor has an excess income and maintains appropriate records, the regular gifts can help to reduce your inheritance tax estate. It's also worth considering um, inheritance tax and um, free investments as those that qualify for business relief. This was previously known as business property relief which can provide an exemption for inheritance tax. Naturally, many business assets will um, qualify for this exemption, but there are also investment type products as well that could qualify. A very popular one for this is um, AMI listed shares, which is probably the best known one. Another popular inheritance tax investment is um, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which is commonly known as the EIS scheme. And when that's added to the potential capital gains tax and income tax benefits, um, this kind of benefit um, investment can prove extremely tax efficient. Uh, the sort of rules around this are that you need to own the asset for two years to qualify for this relief. So in inheritance tax planning, it can be something that can prove a better option because things such as your potentially exempt transfers have got a seven year period in which to wait. We find that with inheritance tax planning, it can be quite an emotive subject. Um, there's no right or wrong answers. On many occasions, people have expressed concerns about parting with their hard earned money and hard saved wealth. And they sort of feel like they're losing control of these funds, which can be very, very worrying for the individuals. With inheritance tax at the current rates of 40%, taking some time to consider some of the areas we've discussed could help you leave more um, of your wealth to your loved ones. And as I said, there are solutions though, and it is possible to affect control matters from beyond one's grave um, by possibly setting up a trust. Therefore, this is a perfect opportunity for me to hand over to Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks uh, for that, Louise and Eddie. <laughs> Right. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm a director of BWK Solicitors. Um, the details of which are on our screen, uh, we have a, an office in Chalfont St Giles and in Stone near Aylesbury. Um, of particular interest, I think, is that uh, you've assumed that we are uh, beholden to our offices, but we actually do get out and see people in their homes quite often um, and also have online meetings, particularly since COVID, uh, which we still offer on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to be talking about wills and powers of attorney uh, and tax uh, and trusts in a minute, but we also uh, offer various standard services that you might expect, such as conveyancing and family law.
people come to us for a variety of reasons. And I always think that the job that I do is, is more of a problem solving exercise. Um, each case is different. Uh, and so although I'm going to give some general information here, it really is a question of sitting down with a family or a, a person to go through their details and what they need um, and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, because quite often people's attitudes to inheritance tax, for example, can be very different. Uh, some people want to try and mitigate it as much as possible and others want to take a, a, a less uh, formal approach to it. Um, so we provide advice and suggestions on how to mitigate tax. Uh, another popular subject is uh, concerns about future care fees, which uh, can be uh, just as detrimental on your estate as inheritance tax and sometimes even worse. Uh, so we can help advise on how best to mitigate care fees or at least plan for them. Um, and one of the uh, other popular uh, topics that seems to be cropping up quite a lot recently is protection of assets uh, for beneficiaries. And that leads me on to uh, what Louise and uh, Eddie have mentioned, which is sort of how to protect assets from other people uh, or outside attack. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, an offshoot of that is vulnerable beneficiaries. So if you have a, a beneficiary that needs protecting, uh, either because they're not particularly good with money or they have an outside influence or even that they are subject to uh, some sort of disability or um, uh, difficulty, uh, then again, uh, protection with wills and trusts might be uh, an option for you. Um, so those are broadly speaking the types of area where I uh, advise people on. Um, everybody knows what a will is and most people know that you need to have one so I'm not going to uh, labour on about that particularly. Uh, a lot of you will probably already have wills in place. Um, perhaps what's less known is how important they are for perhaps not the reasons you expect. Um, uh, most people assume that doing a will is directing where the assets go, and quite often that's the case anyway by the law of intestacy. Um, what I always think the most important thing about doing a will is, is appointing your executors and trustees. This is probably the single most important decision. Who is in charge of carrying out your wishes after you've died? Um, if you are uh, generally younger, then appointment of guardians is also really important and one that I, I think causes the most trouble in decision making as well. Um, just to run through the rest, personal bequests, so personal items is quite often the sentimental items that are more important to people than the money uh, and setting out where they go in the best way. Um, legacies to specific people, charities, friends, uh, relatives. Um, I'll come on to protection of a spouse or a partner in a, a minute um, because that comes under trusts, um, um, but also providing powers that are not automatically provided at law. Uh, the law is extremely limited on the type of powers that executors and trustees have. So most of our wills contain additional clauses that have been thought over many, many years uh, and put together uh, to provide a comprehensive list of powers uh, to cover all eventualities for executors and trustees. Um, and uh, having a will almost reduces a great deal the likelihood of arguments uh, for families. Um, it doesn't cut it out completely, uh, particularly if you're leaving assets to people that um, uh, might be leaving out somebody else, um, but it is the best way of preventing family arguments um, uh, and finally, um, uh, we often come across wills that have been prepared by persons themselves um, and making sure your will is signed and witnessed pro properly is, is absolutely important. Without that, the probate registry are extremely picky and the rules are extremely old. Um, and so uh, we quite often see some really badly drafted or signed and witnessed wills, and that can cause an absolute nightmare for the family or in, indeed the intended beneficiaries. Um, so those are the reasons why I think a will is so important, not necessarily just to direct where you leave your assets to. But within that, and what Eddie and Louise have mentioned, is uh, trusts and um, how they are used. And I personally think they are very misunderstood. Most people think trusts are beyond what they uh, need. Um, perhaps it's it's uh, a, a, an unknown um, uh, area that most people don't know much about. Um, but generally speaking, all a trust is, is putting uh, an asset or assets in a, a place that doesn't belong outright to another person. Um, and it's a protection. 
Uh, and so um, the three main areas that we deal with trusts are to protect for young children. Um, so that can be until they're a set age. And that's what we call a contingency trust. I will leave my estate to my son and daughter at the age of 21. Um, at the age of 21, they receive it. Um, or to protect vulnerable beneficiaries or those with a disability. Uh, and then finally, to provide flexibility if there is uncertainty as to a future. Um, the difficulty in my job is uh, we do try and uh, have somewhat of a crystal ball of trying to predict what uh, a person's going to need or what's going to happen in their life. And of course, that's impossible. So where there is a, a degree of uncertainty, uncertainty um, sometimes the trust works really well for that um, and it's to provide uh, protection uh, for persons or group of people or even just one person so the most popular types of trust that we deal with um, are as I said the ones for contingent age beneficiaries which I'm not going to spend too much time on um, because as I said they're for set ages um, but the two types of trusts that we most commonly deal with as far as estate planning is concerned is discretionary trusts and life interest trusts. Um, so a life interest trust um, deals with uh, setting up a trust for the benefit of one person, usually. And that's quite often is the surviving spouse. Um, so it is a way of protecting an asset for that person, but ultimately you controlling on their death where it goes. If you leave an estate to that person outright, it then becomes theirs and they can do with it as they wish and change their will or leave it or give it away. But if you set up a life interest trust of a specific asset um, for that person, they can use it. And then on their death, you are stipulating where it goes. So it's a very set and co controlled way of providing protection um, for one person. Discretionary trust is a slightly different way to understand you have a list of beneficiaries um, and you have people in charge of that, uh, your trustees, um, and those trustees decide who receives what and when. And that allows for uh, a more flexible uh, a, a set of circumstances if you aren't sure what uh, your beneficiaries are going to need. So. The flexible life interest trust is a combination of the two. Um, with uh, a life interest trust, we commonly see that for uh, people that are more concerned about care fee planning than inheritance tax. Um, discretionary trusts we are seeing now uh, being used um, potentially to try and um, have uh, make sure that we can use the residence nil rate band. Uh, that is sometimes uh, a useful tool, particularly if a person's assets are over the two million mark, uh, because the residence near it band gets lost um, up to the 2.35 million that Louise was talking about earlier. So we sometimes see discretionary trusts being used um, to keep the two estates separate. It doesn't always work. Um, it depends on a person's individual circumstances. Uh, and as I said, life interest trust is more common um, for uh, people that are more concerned about care fees and perhaps uh, the whole lot being used for care fees rather than inheritance tax itself. Um, what we do do is a, a set of combination ones. So we might have a life interest trust over the top of it for one person during their lifetime. And then on their death, it turns into a discretionary trust. Um, and that's quite popular uh, for those people that have uh, two different sets of circumstances, the need to protect a surviving spouse or a person, and then this flexible trust um, for circumstances of which they cannot see in the future. Um, there isn't really a scope here to tell you which one is better. It is very much down to your own individual circumstances. Um, we do lifetime trusts as well as will trusts. Um, in 2006, the government changed the rules regarding lifetime trusts, and they became a lot less palatable uh, for, um, for most people. Uh, but they do, do still have their place at a lifetime trust, particularly if you're looking to make some estate planning now uh, by putting assets out of your name and, and triggering this seven year survivorship period. Um, so we do talk about those two. Um, we do a lot of will trusts because 
most of the time uh, our clients want to ensure that they have control of the assets and it's only after they've died that they wish this sort of protection to be put in place. Um, but as I said here, each trust has its own uses and advantages um, and it's very much down to your own individual circumstances to, to which one suits you better. Um, if you have a trust in your will, it only takes effect on death. If you set up a trust during your lifetime, then that is a live trust. Um, you will notice at the bottom of this slide that I mentioned about trust registration at HMRC. There's been a change to the trust rules in the last year. It's been brewing for some time before that, but it was only earlier this year that HMRC actually gave uh, guidance, sort of guidance, it wasn't very clear in, even in March this year, of what trusts needed to be registered and when. Um, the rule of thumb is most trusts that have already been set up uh, that haven't been previously needed to be registered do now need to be registered. There are some exemptions. So to give an example of a common exemption that we see is if a person has set up what's called a pilot trust, um, this, if it contains less than £100 in and does not have anything for income tax or capital gains tax that we need to declare, if that has been set up prior to the 5th of October 2020, then that does not need to be registered currently. Um, so a pilot trust is a bit like I always say a bank account with a pound in. It's an empty trust that doesn't have anything in it other than a nominal sum. Uh, and it's usually set up either with a will or for perhaps some future planning in mind. Um, but anything else that has assets of more than £100 in, even if it's not taxable for income tax, capital gains tax, um, or any pilot trusts that have been set up since the 5th of October 2020, do now need to be registered. Um, I can deal with that for you. And I believe Eddie also has the power and Louise to, to do that. Um, that's fairly new area, though, so we are still working with HMRC, who seem to be changing the rules all the time about what they need. OK, so that's a brief overview of wills and will trusts. Um, lasting powers of attorney, which, of course, don't really have any uh, particular relation to inheritance tax as such, um, but it's something that I feel very strongly on um, and... Um, really do go hand in hand with wills and estate planning generally. Uh, the idea behind estate planning is to plan for your future and to have everything in place so that um, there are no hassles for either you or your family and lasting powers of attorney very much do come into this. Um, so a will comes into force when you die um, and only then uh, if you are unable to make decisions during your lifetime, then no one, not even your spouse or closest loved ones, have the automatic power to deal with those decisions on your behalf if you cannot. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here to, to make you think about it. What if you lose mental capacity or even that you're physically incapacitated during your lifetime? How would your finances be managed and who would be stuck trying to sort them out? Um, and in addition to that, who would make health decisions as to where you live or the type of care that you receive if you cannot make those decisions? Uh, so I personally think a lasting power of attorney is just as, if not more so, important than a will. Uh, a will is something that you put in place and then you do not see the outcome, whereas a lasting power of attorney, you could well see the outcome of having one or not having one in place. Um, I get a lot of comments about powers of attorney, um, and these are genuinely ones that I, I have heard over the many years that I've been doing this. I will sort them out if something happens. Um, I won't. I don't intend to go into care. Um, it's only needed if I lose my marbles. Um, and what if my attorneys run off with all my money? Um, and the general concern about loss of control, uh, that by signing something on a, a lasting power attorney is going to make you lose control. And that finally, the most common one, I think, is everything's in joint names, so that will be OK. So actually, I'll go back to that. So in order to answer these questions, um, taking the first one, I will do, some, do this when something happens. In order for you to have a power of attorney in place, you have to have mental capacity. It is you that draws it up, 
not somebody else taking it from you. You are granting that power of attorney for somebody else. Um, if you've lost mental capacity, then you cannot do that. So it is a massive risk to leave it until something happens. Um, I say to a number of my clients who are contemplating this, the last thing you want is for something to happen and then for me to be turning up at your bedside at a hospital um, to discuss this. It is far better to have this in place uh, way before anything happens. Um, and it may be that nothing happens uh, particular. Um, and so a lot of people assume that this is just for if you go into care and having done powers of attorney since um, I was 25, um, and that's good 20 years ago, um, I can safely say that the majority of powers of attorney are not used for when you go into care. They are used for the everyday circumstances of being um, ill or not able to get out of the house um, or that you can't hear or that you can't write. Um, and uh, of course, over COVID, we've seen a number of those things come to fruition. Um, it's only needed if I lose my marbles. In actual fact, powers of attorney are used, can, you can set them up so that they are used uh, whether you've lost capacity or not. Um, and as I said, the majority of the times that they're used are simply that a person can't get out of the house or that they're not feeling very well, or even that they're not, uh, they don't want to be bothered with their finances anymore. This is not that they've lost capacity. It is just simply that they want somebody else to take up the hassle for them. Um, there are steps that we can put in place to prevent your attorneys from running off with your money. It is, however, a very powerful document. And so uh, my word of advice is you choose your attorneys with great care. Uh, it is a very much built on trust. Um, you do not lose control, though, and the Mental Capacity Act 2005 uh, does not separate when you have lost capacity or when you have lost the ability to deal with matters. There is always this ability that should you wish to and be able to, you continue with your finances and your attorneys only step in if help is needed. Uh, and that can be on a temporary or indeed a permanent basis. Um, finally, uh, everything in joint names. Um, Yes, it is helpful to have things in joint names, but it is by no means guaranteed. Um, some uh, banks have a very strict banking code. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, um, but I have had cases where I've had to apply to court uh, where there is no power of attorney in place uh, on a joint account. Um, the uh, banking code uh, can be interpreted in different ways. And so some banks say that if one party has lost capacity, then uh, the authority over that general uh, that joint account is lost because you haven't got both parties authority. So it's not guaranteed that a joint account will save it all. Uh, and in any event, most people have something in their sole names um, which would be needed. Uh, I don't wish to scare anybody, but if you haven't got one of these uh, in place, then the only option, should you have lost capacity, um, is for your nearest and dearest to apply to the Court of Protection for a deputyship order. Um, I have one in place at the moment that is extremely standard and it has taken uh, 12 months to get the general order and then it still didn't give us everything that we needed. And here we are 18 months on. And we still have not heard from the Court of Protection. Um, they are extremely slow and very uncommunicative. Um, it is much more formal. It's uh, the court appoints who they decide is correct, not, um, uh, not who you decide. Uh, you have to report every year. Uh, you have to pay for medical evidence to even set up the application, and there's usually a fee for doing so. In fact, the fees generally are five times higher than the uh, general fees for putting in place a lasting power of attorney. Um, you also have to have insurance in place um, that you pay every year. So this is a last resort. If a person hasn't got capacity, this is where you go. I deal with those applications too, but um, it is not ideal. And it is far better to have your set of trusted nominated people in place to do your power, to deal with your affairs, uh, if uh, uh, um, rather than rely on the board application. Um, finance power of attorney, there's two types. There's one for finance and one for health. Um, finance is pretty obvious, but it is everything to do with finances, which could be bank accounts, investments, holdings, selling or transferring your property, dealing with pensions, critically dealing with direct debits and paying bills such as care home fees. Um, as I said before, it 
just because a person's appointed doesn't mean to say they take over, um, they can assist. Um, even if the person is still mentally capable. Um, so I always liken it a bit to a PA, somebody that, that can jump in and out and deal with things on your behalf, but you still uh, can call the shots or they can do a bit more if you can't. Um, so it's very commonly used for people that are just physically frail um, and can't get out to their bank or can't phone their bank or they find it difficult, uh, rather than the, the situation of, say, dementia in a care home, which I think most people assume um, is when it is used the most. Um, health, and power, health and welfare lasting power of attorney is slightly different. Um, it deals with all your health uh, uh, decisions, which uh, a lot of people assume is just sort of life support machine and switching you off, but actually could be type of care that you have, um, important decisions like life support machines and consent to major operations. Uh, but it can be things like consent to a flu jab or a COVID jab, um, what type of care you receive, where you live. Um, those are all health and care decisions. Um, both types of powers of attorney, you can have different attorneys, um, but in order for them to be used, they must be registered at the Office of the Public Guardian, which is a branch of the Court of Protection. Um, so you can draw them up um, and leave them unregistered, but we do recommend registration at the same time uh, because the Office of the Public Guardian are extremely slow. They're taking 12 weeks to register, um, possibly longer, actually, at the moment. So we normally recommend registration and getting the registration done and dusted so that they can be used um, as soon as they are needed without any delay. Um, this is a vital decision making and it might be obvious for a lot of people, but you've got to choose the right people to manage this task. Uh, it can be one person. It can be more than one. You can have a. Um, uh, Persons appointed jointly, or you can have a single person with a backup. Um, as you can see, there are lots of different options. Um, most people have one or two appointed. Some people have replacements. Um, your attorneys have to sign and agree, um, and they have to sign the documentation. So it's always best to check with them first as to whether they can act. So that's pretty much it uh, for my sort of general overview on wills and trusts and uh, powers of attorney. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I think we've already got some. Um, and uh, perhaps I'll hand it back over to Eddie to talk about those. Thank you very much for that, Jennifer. I can certainly echo what you were saying about the difficulties of not having a power of attorney in place. Um, I've got a situation with a client at the moment where it's extremely difficult for the family and their dealings with HMRC to try and move thing, things along, but um, hopefully we will get there. Maybe the best form of inheritance tax planning could be to spend it. I, I do remember a client of mine once telling me that he was very much looking forward to going on a cruise, but the cruise or the thought of going on the cruise was that much more enjoyable in the knowledge that HMRC were contributing 40% towards the cost. So maybe that's a good way to look at it. I mentioned at the outset, we've already got some questions uh, that had come in. So I think I'm going to move straight into those now. The first one uh, will be for you, Louise. This is in connection with um, capital gains tax. The question is, if I gift an asset and pay capital gains tax and then fail to survive the gift by seven years, do I have to pay inheritance tax as well? Well, yes, unfortunately, potentially that could be the case. Um, when making gifts, ideally, they should come from assets that not, do not give rise to capital gains tax. It's also worth remembering what I mentioned about the enterprise investment scheme earlier, as this could be a useful way of mitigating against this happening. OK, thank you for that, Louise. Um, what, one for you now, Jennifer. Um, what's the difference between tenants in common and joint tenants that could apply to a number of taxes I guess but over to you. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, uh, this is a really common question, actually. Um, a lot of people remember the phrase tenants in common or joint tenants, but they don't really understand um, what it, it, in what context it, it's used. So I get a lot of people come in saying, I've done that tenants in common thing, and, and they don't quite understand what it is that they've done. Um, the, if I explain the difference between the two, and then I'll, I'll just move on to how it works in, in conjunction with wills. So um, there are two ways you can jointly own property at the land registry, uh, joint tenants and tenants in common. And joint tenants is normally the default. So if you don't say anything, it's normally uh, set as joint tenants. The land registry, very unhelpfully, do not say one way or the other on the title deeds. So you can't look at the title deeds and go, that's joint tenants or that's tenants in common. Um, it's just us, us uh, legal advisors know what to look for so that we can tell you whether it is or isn't. Um, joint tenants, all it simply means is that that um, one or two, one or more, not more than one person is on the title and there is no defined share. So if you have two or three people owning the property jointly and one of them dies, the others automatically inherit um, by default their share, regardless of anything that they put in their will. This is automatic. Um, tenants in common is a defined share. Now, if you don't say anything about that defined share, and it's equal, but sometimes people have behind the scenes a declaration of trust or a statement saying that a person owns it in unequal shares. Um, so you commonly see this with uh, siblings owning a property or um, uh, friends uh, or perhaps um, new relationships where one party is brought more to the uh, purchase than the other. Um, so you might see a 60-40 arrangement or a 70-30 or something like that. But all tenants in common means is that your share passes according to your will. It does not say what the share is. That's for you to decide and have documented behind the scenes. Uh, but tenants in common simply means that, that your share passes according to your will. The important thing about that, though, is that if you have that tenants in common thing on your, on your title, then it's really important that your will covers what you want to happen with that share. Um, so it's not enough to just have um uh, tenants in common on your title alone that doesn't do anything uh, but what your will then does is it does something with that share and what is important in relation to this discussion is tenants in common is quite important if you are putting a trust in your will or you're doing something in your will with that property either by leaving it outright to your children or into one of those life interest or discretionary trusts that i was talking about earlier um, that just allows uh, the tenants in common just allows your will to then pass that according to your wishes. Um, and we commonly have tenants in common, therefore, for life interest trusts of a half share of the property or a defined share of the property for protection. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another question for you, Louise, uh, in relation to marriage, I believe you can make extra gifts on marriage is there a special allowance yes there is indeed you can so um the additional gift amounts that you can make to um family members and individuals is five thousand pounds to a child um two and a half thousand pounds to a, a grandchild or great grandchild um and then a thousand pounds to anyone else um this can be also be doubled up in effect if um, both parents wish to give similar amounts so effectively 10,000 for a child and then 5,000 for a grandchild great-grandchild okay thank you thank you Louise another question for you coming up uh, Jennifer um, is it a good idea to put my house into my children's names <laughs> Um, so uh, another one that crops up very regularly um, and not really one that I can give a categoric yes or no answer to. Um, I'm generally very cautious at the thought of anyone putting their house during their lifetime into somebody else's names for whatever intention. Um, 
For inheritance tax, it rarely works because you are continuing to live in it. Um, and um, perhaps that's uh, uh, something just also to mention generally is about gifts with reservation of benefit. So when Louise was talking earlier about making gifts and surviving seven years, it is vital that you do not take a benefit from it. Otherwise, that seven year period does not work. Um, so you cannot give your house if you are living in your house alone. You cannot give your house. Well, you, you can give it to your children, but it just simply does not work for inheritance tax purposes. Um, there are a whole host of other um, warning signs uh, about uh, making a gift of such a, a large nature as well. Um, capital gains tax could be an issue. Uh, you're handing your asset over to someone that may not want you to continue to live there. Um, you could fall out with them. They could be made bankrupt or they could even have passed away themselves before you. And then uh, if they've left their estate to the uh, cat's home, uh, your house is owned by the cat's home, which is always a bit disconcerting. So, um, Generally speaking, I'm not in favour of it. There are sometimes good reasons to do so. And occasionally there is an inheritance tax benefit to do so. But it does almost entirely involve the recipient of your gift living with you and uh, uh, to an extent that they're not going to ever move out um, and that they will stay there uh, with you uh, for the foreseeable future. But it is very much down to the individual specific case. Um, of which um, I'm sure um, Stephen Taylor and uh, I can advise on if you, you need to. Um, thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, I, I guess it's worth perhaps mentioning that potentially there could be an inheritance tax exemption if you were to gift the property and then having gifted the property and remained in, in residence, you paid a market rent Oh, yes, it's true. Doing so, but mm. and I think the notion of giving your property away and then paying a rent to continue living there might be a little bit far fetched, but I'm, I'm sure it has been done. It has been done in the past. Um, it, it's just it has to be done properly and um, a full market rent. It can't be a peppercorn or, um, you know, a small amount of money. It has to be done uh, properly. Um, and I should say the in, in the revenue, uh, Eddie, you will know, they're very wise to these sorts of arrangements. And they generally don't like these any kind of convoluted yeah. lifetime scheme. <laughs> um so, yeah, uh, and maybe with the residence nil rate band that has been introduced, that that might have mitigated the desire to perhaps do this kind of thing because of the extra, yeah, the extra allowances that there are. Yeah, no, very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question I have again for you, Jennifer, in connection with potential changes to trust regulations. Can they be applied retrospectively? Um, well, the short answer is yes. And in actual fact, um, with the, the, the changes to the rules, they, they, they pretty much have been uh, adopted retrospectively. Um, as I said a bit earlier, it, it's not... It's not completely the case, but we are finding that a lot of trusts that have been in place for many, many years and have not been um, registered at HMRC already um, because they haven't needed to be are now all of a sudden needing to be. So I'll, I'll give an example of probably the most common one that crops up for us is where a person um, many years ago, a husband and wife set up what's called a nil rate band discretionary trust, which was very common prior to 2007 and remained and still is quite common, uh, where one spouse has died and left the nil rate band into a discretionary trust. Um, the surviving spouse has continued uh, to live on, uh, and usually at that point they receive a loan from the discretionary trust of the assets uh, under what's called a debt charge scheme. Very common situation before 2007 and still today. Um, those trusts, because all they had in them was a, a, an IOU loan, um, didn't need to be registered because there was no interest for the income revenue. They didn't get any capital gains tax and they didn't get any income tax because all that was in the trust was an IOU. 
Um, so they didn't want to know. And so these, these trusts were quite commonly not registered with the Inland Revenue. They are caught by the new registration rules um, because they have more than £100 in them, uh, even though it's an IOU. Um, it now needs to be registered. So we have seen in the last couple of months a huge tidying up exercise of registration of trusts uh, where we've discovered uh, life policies and uh, these types of nil rate band discretionary trust lurking, it dust is gathering dust in the background, uh, quite often finding that the trustees aren't correct because they've just been left. Um, so we've had a huge tidying up exercise for all sorts of trusts that have come through our doors in the last few weeks. So yes, they are retrospective. Um, if you've set up a trust, um, you need to look at whether it needs to be registered or not. Um, happy to help there. Well, thank you very much for that, Jennifer. So I'll just check with my colleague, Suzanne, to see if we've any further questions that have come in. I haven't seen any others, so hopefully we've covered everything off. And yes, that's again, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. So many thanks to Louise and Jennifer for your presentations, and also a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope that you found this of interest. As mentioned at the outset, we will be making the slides available uh, very shortly. If you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to come back to us. But thank you once again for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon.